Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here in Washington, D.C. at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. They have a cyber uh, disrupt event here that's going on, which is an all-day event where folks, uh, some of the smartest folks in cyber are talking about cyber, whether in the administration or not. And we're honored to have with us Jim Miller, who is, uh, was until uh, 2014 the Undersecretary of Defense uh, for Policy at the Pentagon and is now with Adaptive Strategies. Sir, thanks for joining us. Glad to be here, Vaga. Obviously, you just got off a panel discussion. It was you, Chris Painter, uh, Jim Lewis, uh, obviously from CSIS, one of the nation's leading cyber experts, uh, you know, on a, on a moderated uh, discussion. Talk to us a little bit. You know, you guys covered a fantastic realm of themes from, you know, deterrence, which is something that you wrestled with, uh, the Obama administration uh, wrestled with, uh, what the line is between what a cyber attack uh, and, uh, you know, when a cyber attack deserves a kinetic response. Uh, Jim raised the issue of uh, do things like Stuxnet, uh, neither, not that you could comment on that or anything that happened with the North Koreans. It, you know, where does it deter? How does it deter? As you're looking, you know, what advice do you have for the new administration as they wrap their minds around cyber? Obviously, the president issued a draft sort of cyber. Uh, there have been a whole series of, of, of draft uh, or leaked documents that are out there about the administration's view to cyber. And we heard, obviously, from, from Tom this morning. But tell us a little bit about what your advice would be as somebody who's spent quite a lot of time in this space, both on the kinetic side but also on the cyber side. That's great, Vago. First of all, the new administration is right to put cyber as a high priority as it goes forward. It's uh, such a critical enabler for our economy, for our, side, our society, and of course for our military as well. And what I would say is, uh, think about the problem set for cyber deterrence specifically as having three core parts. First is what we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, what I call the death by a thousand hacks. And it includes the North Korea hack of Sony Entertainment, it includes the Iranian uh, distributed denial of service attack in 2012-2013, and it also includes cases where we see uh, cyber uses a tool in other campaigns, the Russian uh, interference in our elections uh, this last time around, and the Chinese uh, theft of intellectual property through cyber over, over a period of more than a decade. So that's problem one, and it's one that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and we need to have a posture on a strategy to deal with it. Uh, the last administration made some progress, and this administration, I think, needs to take more substantive uh, steps. Problem set two is that we can't put ourselves in a position where a North Korea or an Iran or a terrorist group or other non-state actor can hold our critical infrastructure at, at risk uh, for catastrophic attack. Uh, they may get lucky and have a, a small attack. Uh, we would like to prevent that, of course, but we can't allow them to get to the threshold of catastrophic uh, cyber attack uh, uh, potential for us any more than we can for nuclear weapons. And so that means hardening the critical infrastructure uh, at least to that level. Uh, so that these lesser actors, medium-sized powers, if you will, can't get uh, uh, the ability to have catastrophic attack. And the third problem set is longer term, but it's fundamentally important, and it's about uh, our deterrence posture vis-a-vis -vis Russia and China in particular. And we cannot uh, accept a situation in which uh, Russia or China has the capacity to hold our critical infrastructure at risk, which is true to some degree today and will grow over time. We, we are not postured and we're not taking the steps necessary to prevent that. Uh, and uh, so that will happen, uh, it, increasing vulnerability of our critical infrastructure. Uh, we can't allow that to happen at the same time that we have growing vulnerabilities of our military. So much of the work that I've, I've been involved with lately, including for the Defense Science Board Task Force on Cyber Deterrence, has looked at what steps the Department of Defense should take uh, to uh, support our deterrence posture uh, and to support strategic stability over time as well. What is the role of, have we decided and determined what that line is between what is a cyber attack? Because if you look at it, the Russians also have been brilliant as part of their doctrine. They're meddling very actively, obviously in the U.S. elections, but clearly in the Netherlands. There's, uh, um, you know, a lot of evidence that the Russians were very involved in Brexit, obviously very involved, obviously in France as well. But other countries where both on, uh, whether it's on the leftist side or on the rightist side, there's Russian involvement. So that's driving outcomes of another means. Right. But where do you draw the line between at what point the United States, and does it have to be more declaratory and clear so that everybody knows, you know, uh, it's a little bit like the scene in Dr. Strangelove, right? I mean, you don't have okay. deterrence unless, uh, you know, okay. uh, do you need that line at some point? Uh, Vago, the, the first thing that we need is a, a clear policy of response. And, and I, I, I think that our declaratory policy and our actual policy should be 
if, uh, if, if you undertake a cyber attack against the United States, we will respond, full stop. It's not a question of whether, it's a question of how, and we'll bring the range of capabilities from uh, cyber response to a military response at the high end to diplomatic actions and sanctions and so forth as well. Uh, but we should have a, a policy that we will respond, and we will respond uh, uh, swiftly and uh, to impose cost as well. So that's 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 uh, uh, part one. I don't think that it's it makes sense to have a you know a large number of red lines, if you will, uh, uh, that that uh, someone else may cross. I think we have a good understanding of what uh, is involved in a cyber attack. So it could involve the destruction of equipment. Think of the Iranian hack of uh, Saudi Aramco that fried some computers. It could involve disruption. Uh, for example, the Iranian distributed denial of service attack in 2012-2013. Uh, and it could involve the, uh, uh, the messing with data as well, uh, so that uh, that could affect financial transactions or other other things. So we understand what that is, uh, and it, we in each of the uh, each uh, case in which we had a cyber attack, we need to respond and we need to have that understood. We also need to respond to what I call costly cyber intrusions, and that includes the theft of intellectual property and so forth. Uh, and we need to do this not on a one-off basis, but as a campaign. It needs to be. Uh, a, if you will, a whole of government campaign. Uh, military is not in the lead. Military is an option. Uh, it needs to include offensive cyber uh, as an option, but it's not a presumption that that would be the, the response. Uh, and we need to have this thought through and articulated first to ourselves, then to our allies and partners, and then to our potential adversaries. Uh, uh, otherwise, we're in a response mode, and we need to be in a more proactive deterrence mode. Do you think that, um, you know, when it, how would you rate where the United States is now in terms of its capabilities? Obviously, this was a big focus during the Obama administration. It did start in the Bush administration where there was a lot of work uh, identifying the challenges and then addressing it. I remember, t you know, every time I talked to Bill Lynn when he was deputy secretary, that was one of the top focus, one of the top things that he was always talking about. How much progress has the department made, do you think, in bolstering its defenses? Let me, let me take that and then I have a follow-up on that. Sure, sure. I think that... Uh for the Department of Defense, it's made uh, pretty substantial progress in uh, strengthening its capabilities for both offense and defense. It has a lot more work to do uh, with the establishment of the Cyber Mission Force and the, and, the, and the associated teams. It's taken a critical next step, and it's, but it's important to understand, Vago, this is uh, one step in, a, in what's going to be a long journey. Uh, and as we work to uh, uh, improve the defensive posture of the department, uh, the steps that are taken to include cyber disruption as a part of exercises are important, uh, but the department's going to need to prioritize its investments in cybersecurity more than it has to date uh, and give a particular priority to those capabilities, those systems that are important to deter uh, strategic attack, uh, if you will, not just nuclear, but uh, long-range attack, whether through cyberspace or otherwise. Do you think that some of the defense, you know, I was talking to somebody who was uh, telling me that, you know, DOD systems are now so restrictive that folks are using their personal email accounts because anything that's a big file is seen as an intrusion or doesn't go through. I mean, at what point do some of these defensive uh, systems that we're setting up actually end up hampering and causing greater vulnerability? Obviously, if people start to, you know, they shouldn't be doing it. I remember, you know, f folks in the Bush administration telling people, like, don't use your personal accounts to to handle this stuff, even though it may be more convenient. You know, what are, you know, and obviously we have the whole email the servers thing, right? You could talk about, you know, Jeb Bush has had that, and Mike Pence has even had that, and obviously the most prominent one was Hillary Clinton. But, it, you know, at what point, what kind of a strategy do you need to make sure that your own protective systems don't drive bad behaviors that then end up costing you, causing you even bigger problems? Yeah, a, a great question, Vago, and uh, two different levels of the answer. One is the infrastructure that we use for day-to-day -day communications that in, in the Department of Defense that both uh, civilians and military use, and the unclassified version of that, as you know, is the NipperNet. Uh, and uh, we, uh, the Department has put together a, a pretty good defensive posture for the NipperNet, but it's not by any stretch invulnerable. And the first rule is that people need to understand that uh, although it is more secure, than your personal, uh, uh, than your personal device, your iPhone, and so on. Uh, that, by, and when you're protected by the NipperNet, that is not fully secure. And that, uh, uh, to get that higher degree of security, it means going to higher classified networks. And so the discipline to, uh, to uh, understand 
uh, that it's not just vulnerable, but it may be penetrated, uh, that, it, that uh, an email on the so-called Nippernet can be forwarded to the broader inter internet, uh, and, then to, and then to use uh, um, good discipline and communications as a, as a fundamental starting point. Do you think um, that when you're looking at strategy and r broader strategy, and I know you focused a lot on this when you were you were undersecretary, uh, whether it was for Russia or whether it was for for China, uh, some of which we know about, some of which we don't know uh, as much about. But does cyber have to be sort of a separate thing or integrated into the whole of an approach that we take to a particular country? Because, for example, if you look at China, obviously a whole series of issues there, territorial issues, island building, uh, you know, coercion, economic coercion, and on top of it you have this cyber theft that's aimed at all of uh, it, its its friends and its uh, potential potential adversaries, uh, particularly from an economic theft standpoint. You mentioned ditto on the Russians, right? We partnered in order to do an Iran deal with them on the same at the same time that the, the Russians have put quite a lot of pressure on Estonia, Baltics, a lot of our allies on, on the cyber front, and you could argue even, even in our, you know, in the case of our national elections, what's the right approach to use where it's not sort of a cyber strategy and a, and a national strategy? How do you integrate that into the strategy and, and make clear the red lines for each one of these countries that there will be repercussions and they may come at you from very unanticipated ways? Michael, it's a great question and uh, uh, the, the premise is exactly right. It's both a domain unto itself. Uh, and and if, if you mentioned Bill Lynn, and I, and I think of our first cyber, de our first cyber strategy of the Department of Defense, uh, uh, the, the number one pillar of that was to understand that cyberspace is a, is a domain, and it's a domain of human activity, and it's a, a potential domain of conflict as well. There are things unique to it, uh, just as there are to the maritime domain or the air domain uh, and so forth, uh, including in commerce, including in, 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 in moving goods and people and so forth. And there are elements that are relevant to the military as well. Uh, so, there are some specific aspects uh, of it that it make where it makes sense to think of it uh, on its own. But your premise that uh, it really needs to be thought of is in, in the broader context of the relationship uh, between the United States and our allies and partners, the relationship between the United States and Russia and, and with China, uh, and that often cyberspace uh, is uh, an enabler, uh, whether of effective communication. Uh, or of disruption. Uh, 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 it can be a part of what we do uh, uh, to effectively communicate uh, with, our, uh, with our allies and partners to our own publics. Uh, and it can also be a tool, if it's used uh, offensively, uh, that, uh, that imposes costs on us and our allies, and so we need to be prepared for both of those. But fundamentally, uh, uh, it's, uh, we need to treat cyberspace in a way analogous to how we treat uh, other domains. Uh, that means when we think about a deterrence posture, it's not only about cyber deterrence, it's about deterring uh, individuals on the other side. And obviously pulling our allies in too. I mean, at what point do there have to be greater clarity, for example, on Article 5 and a whole bunch of other things? Because, you know, Peter Holtfuss, the Swedish defense uh, minister, has even talked about, you know, hybrid you know, at what point do, do little green men and police actions actually trigger uh, wider, whether EU or, or, or NATO defenses? And obviously NATO leaders have talked about it. What kind of work has to happen on the part of the United States and its allies on this, where from an alliance standpoint, there are a lot of vulnerabilities through some of the smaller countries that may not have as much, uh, you know, obviously they're, they're meeting NATO standard, but that standard is tends to be dumbed down to the lowest common denominator in some of these cases. You know, what, what's the right approach to take from a, from a transatlantic or even trans-Pacific perspective, you know, if, if you're looking at aiming some of these deterrent measures at China, you know, not just Russia? Um, uh, first principle uh, in, in uh, pursuing that type of a dialogue and that type of a capability is to, uh, is to look at the bigger picture, as we were talking about before. And uh, it means thinking about the, both the gray zone activities that we see today, whether it's Russia uh, with little green men in Ukraine, uh, whether it's China in the South China Sea, uh, including with maritime, you know, non-military maritime vessels, little blue men, little blue, <laughs> little blue men, uh, and uh, or whether it's at a higher uh, uh, a higher level of escalation, or whether it's about our our day-to-day -day activities as well. And it, uh, I am not an advocate of having multiple red lines uh, uh, or having a, a, a uh, or having uh, cyber-specific red lines in a sense. Uh, if it's an attack, we should respond. If it's a cost of cyber intrusion, we should respond. We can't define all the possible cases in, in, uh, uh, in advance, uh, and we have to show that we are willing to respond by doing it and, and 
uh, to do it uh, quickly and to do it with international support requires uh, more planning than has been done so far and in, in a campaign framework for that planning. And we need to involve our allies uh, in that discussion. Uh, as you noted, uh, you know, uh, at the last uh, NATO summit, cyber was lifted up a level. And uh, for decades, the focus of the NATO deterrence posture was conventional and nuclear capabilities. In 2010, at Lisbon, the alliance added missile defense as a core capability. Cyber is in an ambiguous position, and it's, at this point, a vulnerability of NATO. Uh, and I think clarifying that through uh, not just discussions, but through exercises and then investment uh, in some of our key allies will be an important step. Let me ask you a uh, last question, which is not a cyber-related question, but is an EU-NATO um, question. Um, obviously, we had the Vice President uh, and Jim Mattis and Rex Tillerson went to, went to Europe, uh, gave a lot of assurances on behalf of the President, but the President himself has been very skeptical about NATO, uh, much more focused on allies spending more money. And, you know, some of the President's closest advisors have been working or have pledged to work with those forces who want the dissolution of the EU. And obviously, the big Netherlands vote is today. So full disclosure, at the time we're taping this, we don't know what the outcome of uh, whether uh, Geert Wilders is, is going to end up winning. But what are the potential implications for the security implications for the United States of an implosion of an EU that every American administration, going back to the Truman administration, has advocated as, as a way of binding European nations? Histor I think with a proven track record of being quarrelsome, uh, or as the EU ambassador uh, David O'Sullivan told us recently, you know, Europe has a tendency of producing more nationalism than it can consume, so the EU is a very, very good thing. You know, what are the potential security implications? Um, should the Netherlands vote, should the French vote, should, 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 you know, the German vote, and ultimately combined with Brexit, what are the security implications for this, of, of that disillusion on the United States? Vago, there's no question we're seeing an increased trend toward nation nationalism. Uh, we see it in the United States, we see it in many of our allies, and that's uh, that's something that we need to deal with, with res uh, not just with respect to national defense policies, but with respect to economic and social policies as well. Uh, fundamentally, the United States has a, has a, a, a core and vital interest uh, in, in Europe uh, and in the, in the EU continuing, and particularly in NATO continuing and being strong. And the, uh, and the, and, uh, and the steps that we take to enhance uh, uh, to enhance not just our own capabilities, but to support our allies, our NATO allies, and in the Asia Pacific, our allies and partners there, and, and in the Middle East, our, our partners there. Those are not steps that we're taking to help them uh, 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 in order uh, to, be, uh, to be nice people. Uh, they're fundamentally steps that we're taking in our national interest. And, under, and being able to communicate that fact effectively and being able to give examples uh, of uh, beyond just war avoidance of why having these institutions in place is valuable to the United States for, uh, for opening up markets, uh, for, uh, uh, for allowing the free movement of, of people and goods, uh, and for, yes, at, at, the bottom, at, at the bottom line, reducing risk of conflict as well, are fundamentally in American interest. And I think that, uh, uh, I, I think that getting that message out is fundamentally important. I'm very pleased to see Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, and others out there making that case. Uh, one last question. Uh, since you are the senior most defense official that I've talked to uh, um, since, uh, you know, obviously the talk about the deep, deep cuts to the State Department uh, budget, to the foreign aid budget, as a senior former defense official, how important is that foreign affairs funding from your standpoint, that foreign aid funding, that international development assistance funding to the execution of national security, you know, and, and how much more broadly is our national security dependent on other agencies, not just the Pentagon? Uh, fundamentally important. And uh, Secretary Mattis, before he was Secretary Mattis, when he was General Mattis, I, you'll probably remember, he said, if you cut the State Department budget significantly, you're going to have to buy me more bullets. That's not a smart strategy for, uh, for the United States. Uh, there's no question that uh, the so-called soft power of our, of our diplomatic corps of our economic engagement and of, and of our democracy itself are fundamental to our national security. And I believe it would be incredibly short-sighted to, uh, to, to make deep cuts and to, and to gut the State Department or any of our other uh, um, uh, uh, elements of, of national power, including USAID. Sir, thanks very much for the time. We really appreciate it. Pleasure, Vago. Good to see you.